Good morning. Uh, I'm Bill Brock. I'm a trustee at CSIS, and I'm filling in for our uh, leader, Dr. John Hamry, who is in, uh, in Japan. Just a couple of prelim preliminary comments. First, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, participating in what is a, an important conversation among friends. I emphasize both words. It is important, and we are good friends, and that's, that's crucial. Um, just to give you a little bit of my own um, area of interest in this conversation, uh, one personal story. I was uh, national chairman of our party when we won the election with Ronald Reagan, and uh, he had lunch over at the RNC, and we thought we were going to be talking about working together on inauguration. He said, oh, Bill, what would you like to do? Would you like to be in the administration? I said, yes, sir. He said, what would you like? And I said, I'd like to be the United States Trade Representative. He said, really? He said, I thought you'd want one of the, uh, the other cabinet positions. And I said, well, sir, uh, I honestly believe that economics trade is going to have more to do with the peace and stability of the world than almost anything else. I thought that then. I, I think it now. In part because this is such a radically, dramatically different world. Minister Turnbull last night mentioned the fact that uh, we can walk around these days with a handheld device that has the power of a supercomputer not too long ago. I tell these young people when I talk in college, none of you had the, even started grammar school when the internet came on board. In the mid-1990s, it changed the world. We now have and live in a knowledge-based, technology-driven, highly competitive global economy. And the, the economic consequences are just extraordinary. We have all the new economic powers. China, India, Brazil. I'm not mentioning Russia yet. We'll see. But what's changed, what's different, is that phrase knowledge-based. We have an education issue that not enough countries, and certainly not this one, are paying attention to because the demands of the workplace are so dramatically different. We have the obvious challenge of cybersecurity. It's been dramatically in evidence in the last year. We have the fact that uh, we don't have nation state issues so much as we do uh, international terror based upon, at least ostensibly, on uh, things like religion as the claim of the basis anyway. We have the ability to communicate so rapidly that we're not reading anymore. We get our news from blogs, or at least many of us do. So we have conversations like this uh, to make sure that these challenges are something we work together on, because we know that we can achieve so much more with mutual effort than we can by uh, unilateral action, whether it's TPP or uh, APEC or the security area. Uh, I think the special thing about this particular conversation this morning is the participation. We've got, obviously, Ambassador Kim Beasley. We've got uh, Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. We've got Minister of Communications Malcolm Turnbull. But we also have uh, Prime Minister Abbott addressing us by a digital link shortly. And we have an extraordinary group of participants here in, here in the room. So just, oh, I should uh, add that, um, as my friend Ernie has suggested, that CSIS is trying to broaden the conversation to a lot of people that are not here present by uh, a digital, is that what you call it? <laughs> Uh, broadcast or webcast, plus uh, tweeting. 
We have now an opportunity to talk about how we can work on deepening and broadening a dynamic relationship that has become more dynamic, dynamic as we face more aggressive challenges. And the opportunities uh, are also rapidly changing and equally dynamic. So I want to begin by asking our, my friend and colleague to take this podium. Professor uh, Bates Gill has uh, worked here at CIS to our benefit, worked at Bookings Institution. He is our partner as the United, head of the United States Study, Study Center in Australia, and he also headed the uh, Stockholm Center for Studies on International Peace. And I'm glad you succeeded there. So, Professor Gill, uh, we thank you for being here. We thank you all for being here. And I will leave the podium to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator, Senator Brock, and um, thanks very much to CSIS uh, for partnering with us for this, uh, for this day and for our discussions on U.S.-Australia relations. I want to extend a special uh, thank you, uh, of course, to Dr. Hamry, uh, as well as to Mike Green and, and Ernie Bauer, uh, who we've been working very closely with over the past several months to, to pull this all together. Special thanks, of course, to uh, the excellent, excellent team uh, that Ernie and Mike have working for them here. Um, let me say as, a, as an alum of CSIS just uh, how proud I am to be able to stand here today uh, and work with, with you uh, in partnership, uh, but also to uh, extend uh, the heartiest congratulations from me and all of us uh, at the U.S. Studies Center uh, in the uh, establishment of this fantastic new headquarters for uh, CSIS. What a, re what a remarkable building, and we're very, very proud and honored to be able to be one of the earliest uh, uh, foreign participants to be able to uh, hold an event here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the U.S. Studies Center um, is uh, in Australia, uh, the leading institution concerned with uh, raising awareness and building uh, understanding about the United States across the full range of issues uh, of concern, uh, not just in foreign policy and defense and security or the traditional issues of, of U.S.-Australia alliance relations, but the full panoply of uh, American domestic politics, American history, American literature, American culture, media, and the arts. And I found it just a fascinating opportunity to be able to work uh, at the U.S. Studies Center uh, and tap into the depth and breadth of interest uh, that there is uh, in Australia on all things American. Uh, we hope to be able to build uh, over the coming years to establish an even uh, wider network of relationships, not just in Australia, uh, for example, in the establishment of the new Perth US uh, Asia Center at the University of Western Australia, uh, but by building up our profile in the United States and even across Asia uh, with other institutions that are equally interested and concerned with raising awareness and understanding about uh, the United States. So I see uh, today's event very much uh, a part of our ongoing effort to, to strengthen our profile here in the United States and build new partnerships uh, with, with institutions like CSIS and others across the country. Um, today we are gathered under the uh, banner of Alliance 21, uh, which is a, a multi-year project uh, being led by the U.S. Studies Center, uh, which is trying to look uh, across the various aspects of the U.S.-Australia relationship and think forward about how in the 21st century, in the context of an emerging Asia, uh, our two countries can continue to build and strengthen our relationship, not just on questions of uh, foreign affairs and defense, but across uh, the full relationship to include questions of trade and investment, uh, resources and sustainability, uh, energy security, working with partners in an, e in an emerging Asia on questions of education and innovation. 
Um, we've been very fortunate uh, to have the support of a number of key uh, sponsors uh, that have been behind this effort for a number of years, uh, and without uh, their support, we wouldn't be able to convene here today. I do want to extend my gratitude to them. Uh, this includes the Australian federal government, uh, but also a number of key corporate sponsors, a number of representatives who are with us uh, today, uh, from Dow Chemical, uh, from Chevron, from ConocoPhillips, from uh, GE, from News Corp, uh, from Vizi, uh, Morgan Stanley, and Raytheon. Uh, these are companies that have uh, significant uh, presences in Australia uh, that are very, very keen to see uh, a strong relationship emerge uh, at all levels between our two countries, and uh, I'm extremely grateful for the support they've extended to us. Uh, we're also very fortunate in this particular event uh, to be uh, supported by the Good Day USA. Uh, this, as you all know, is the annual uh, set of activities uh, sponsored by the Australian government and a number of um, Australian state governments as well uh, that try to, uh, across this country, uh, raise the profile and awareness and understanding of Australia here in the United States. So we, we thank our, our supporters at Good Day as well. Um, with that, I want to uh, then turn the floor over to uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who is going to be uh, offering some uh, uh, welcoming remarks. Let me again thank all of you for taking the time, especially given the inclement weather we're dealing with here uh, in, in Washington these days. Thank you all very, very much. Looking forward to an excellent set of discussions. I'm pleased to send my best wishes to everyone attending the Alliance 21 conference. Australians and Americans have a natural affinity for each other. We share language, values and a long history in peace and in conflict. Australia and the United States have two of the most robust democracies in the world. And yet, for three quarters of a century, this alliance of ours has been beyond politics. We both know in the marrow of our bones that we can do so much more together than apart. This alliance is more than a security pact. It's a commitment by two like-minded liberal democracies to support the values that underpin our way of life, free enterprise, free trade, free speech, and a belief in citizens ahead of government. So I commend the US Studies Centre for its work driving the Alliance 21 program. This conference explores how we can strengthen the relationship during the decades ahead because this alliance is the bedrock of our security. And the power shifts in our region mean that this will be just as true in the 21st century as it was in the 20th. I wish you well in your deliberations and I look forward to learning of the results of this conference. Good morning. I'm uh, Michael Green, Senior Vice President for Asia at CSIS. <clears throat> I am uh, impressed and, to be honest, a little bit surprised at the good turnout we have this morning. We were making contingency plans at 6.30 this morning that were unnecessary. Um, I should not have been surprised. General Ludendorff didn't stop us at the Battle of Amiens. Of Amiens. The Japanese Navy didn't stop us at Coral Sea. The North Koreans didn't stop us at the Hook. The Taliban, Taliban didn't stop us with OEF. Washingtonians are usually gripped with absolute panic and paralysis at an inch or two of snow, but I should have known that U.S.-Australia alliance discussions and ties would have uh, soldiered on uh, no matter what hit us. That said, 
um, we thought we would open today's discussion with a quote unquote reality check, uh, looking at uh, how the Alliance is positioned for challenges that will come in the future. Um, instead of giving the tribute we often uh, and appropriately give to the GIs and the diggers, um, asking ourselves um, what black swans are out there, what challenges might throw us off course. Um, not with the expectation the Alliance isn't up to it, um, but with the foresight and strategic wisdom that have characterized our relations for many, many decades. Um, to help us with this stress test or uh, reality check, we have two of the most committed and experienced uh, managers of our alliance uh, to join us today. Um, the Honorable Richard Armitage uh, is a trustee at CSIS uh, and on the Council of Advisors for the U.S. Studies Center. Um, Rich became president of Armitage International in 2005 after distinguished service as the Deputy Secretary of State. He served previously as ambassador to a number of uh, problem challenges around the world, uh, the key Asia position in the Pentagon uh, under the Reagan administration and a storied uh, period of service uh, during the Vietnam War. And Rich is um, a mentor and a guide to, I was going to say generations, but I didn't want to make him feel old. So I'll just say uh, a rising generation of Asia experts in this town, um, all of whom are, are grateful for his service and his example. Um, the Honorable Dr. Brendan Nelson is director of the Australian War Memorial. Um, a memorial I've visited a number of times as a tourist and also with President Bush when I was working in the uh, White House. It is, I think, and I've worked in war memorials, the most moving um, and honest uh, war memorial uh, anywhere on the globe. Um, Brendan uh, came in to public service uh, as the youngest um, national president of the Australian Medical Association, which if it's like the US American Medical Association is a pretty powerful post indeed. Uh, he was elected to federal parliament in 1996 and served as the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Defense. He led the Liberal Party in opposition uh, in 2007 and served as ambassador to NATO um, uh, before joining uh, the War Memorial as president. Um, and in that position played a key role in broadening Australia's relations with NATO, a uh, topic we may come to today because it is absolutely in U.S. interests for our allies to network and strengthen their bonds with each other to stabilize the international system. And we'd like to invite and include all of you to participate in the discussion. So we have these, these are not mutes <laughs> uh, uh, to control the discussion up here. These are clickers that allow you to vote. Um, and we've used these in the past. They are not scientific. Um, you only get to vote once. So don't try to push repeatedly to try to increase your tally. You'll find uh, on the clickers that um, the uh, letters run from A to E, and there will be multiple choice questions. I think, um, let me look at my technical guys. You have to push this red button to turn it on. Uh, so there's a small round sort of orange colored button at the top to turn it on. Um, and we will um, ask you uh, to vote on some of the stress test or reality check questions we want to pose to our two panelists so that they can react to, respond to, be educated by, or correct uh, the perceptions uh, in the audience. Um, but first, if I could, before we go through, through some of these questions, I'd like to turn to Rich and Brendan and ask them for some, for, for some opening observations on where they see the alliance on this snowy day in 2014. Uh, Brendan? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I always hesitate to add to the introduction, but thank you very much for the generous one. But the other thing that I did, which is relevant to the discussion, I was Minister for Defence uh, uh, for Australia as well, along with my esteemed uh, former colleague, Robert Hill. Uh, the Alliance, of course, uh, was born uh, of idealism and forged in reality, uh, particularly in the depths of the Second World War. Uh, I can tell you that not only at the Australian War Memorial, but uh, throughout the country, there isn't a day goes by in Australia where privately nor prob publicly uh, we give thanks for American sacrifice in the Pacific from 1942 until the end of the war. Uh, Formalised in 1951, uh, we're now, of course, in the uh, 63rd year. And from my perspective, I think the Alliance is in very good shape. Uh, it's growing. Uh, the fact that there are so many here, uh, both from Australia and the United States and perhaps some other countries uh, to participate in this is in part testimony to that. Uh, it's uh, historically, of course, uh, been born of uh, conflict, 
and um, been focused predominantly on defence, security and foreign policy issues, but it's expanded uh, beyond uh, capability uh, and intelligence and interoperability and security into economic, uh, trade, uh, education, research, uh, energy and other areas of cooperation in part that we're uh, dealing with today. If you think about uh, some of the um, things that have been testing the Alliance in recent times, uh, the criminality of uh, Snowden, uh, certainly as I see it, amongst other things, um, and uh, uh, it's obvious that these kinds of events and the transformation in the world that's occurring in the Asia-Pacific and the template for the US-China relationship that's being built in it, uh, it's uh, clear, at least for, certainly from my perspective, that the Alliance is strengthening and uh, certainly is becoming more relevant uh, in this century than perhaps it was in the past. And having spent three years also at uh, NATO, uh, I can see that Australia and the Alliance for the United States is a, is a, has significant potential to leverage influ US influence in the Euro-Atlantic uh, area and to get it focused on the Asia-Pacific. Oh, thank you, Rich. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, the honour for me is to be sitting next to uh, Dr. Nelson, a man who is Defence Minister of Australia, was not afraid to make a decision. Uh, I hope it's catching, and I uh, hope I can take some of that back with me. Uh, Tony Abbott uh, this morning, the Prime Minister, mentioned that we share common language, common values, uh, common commitments. Uh, when President Obama went to Australia recently and spoke to the Parliament, he indicated that there are some other things we have in common. Uh, Australians and Americans, uh, some of, of whom came to their respective countries of their own choice, and some who came in chains. But most importantly, uh, that we believe that everyone should get a fair go, whether you're American or whether you're Australian. Now, if it's the case that the whole center of gravity of the world has shifted to the Indo-Pacific, and I believe it has, uh, then that put Aust puts Australia right in the middle of it. And I thought in the 2013 white paper, Australia put a big burden on the United States. The burden was that we were expected to maximize cooperation with China and minimize competitive aspects of our being, uh, and also that we'll always be the, the, the uh, implication in the 2013 white paper was that uh, the United States would always be there for Australia. I personally hope that's the case. I personally would fight for that. Uh, but uh, to the extent Australia is not seen as doing their share in this alliance, and I'm talking about money into the defense budget, then this puts a little pressure. I think on that, uh, the, the implication that the United States will always be there. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I'm looking forward to the comments that our audience will make or the answers to the various questions, and uh, we'll try to give you a good go. Thank you, Rich. And I apologize for skipping one of the most consequential parts of your resume, which was also one of the most consequential periods for our alliance. Um, we're going to go back to some of the issues you both mentioned, um, talk about uh, directions in U.S policy and strategy in Asia, the pivot and so forth, <clears throat> um, ask you about the structure of international politics, um, the relative power of the United States, how much that matters to Australia, um, the changing dynamics in both our relationships with China and what that means for our alliance, uh, energy and trade um, and security uh, issues we're trying to strengthen between us to deal with these changes. Let me begin with U.S. policy since we're in Washington. Um, and ask you to uh, prepare your clickers in the audience. Um, we, uh, uh, are we ready to go? Okay. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask the audience and then turn to our panelists on is this one. The U.S. rebalance to the Asia Pacific was announced by President Obama in Australia in November 2011. How would you evaluate the success of the rebalance to date, let's start with, with Rich, and then we'll go to Minister Nelson. Well, my, my view of the rebound. I, I blew the clickers. My apologies, Rich. We actually need to hear from the audience first. <laughs> we are a democracy. Um, my apologies. So um, if I could ask you, sorry about that. So if I could ask you to use your clickers, um, you can see it's uh, A, well the uh, rebalance is well designed and well implemented, B, well designed but poorly implemented, C, poorly designed, D, not important to the region, and E, don't know. Um, and uh, if I could ask you to uh, hit A, A through E, one of the uh, letters that corresponds with your view of the administration's rebalance to the Asia Pacific.
Either we're having technical difficulty or the rebalance has made no impression on anyone. Is it the former? Uh, okay. Okay, we're going to pass on this one. I'll give you a minute or two to see if you can fix it. Um, so, sorry, Rich, back to you. How do you uh, evaluate the rebalance? Well, I thought rebalancing was an appropriate articulation of uh, our strategic interest and where the important strategic interests lie. However, I think it was poorly done, and I think it was poorly designed, uh, and it was hastily run mm -hmm. out, uh, and it left us uh, depending much too much on just the security aspects of rebalancing and not as I've said before, the other arrows in our quiver, foreign direct investment, trade policy, uh, cultural, political, uh, educational uh, exchanges, et cetera. Yeah, I, uh, I've got to say, I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Rich. I, um, the, the rebalance, uh, in fact, whatever language is used to describe it, originally, of course, as you know, it was described as the pivot. And uh, I was in Europe at the time, uh, dealing with Europeans, both at the European Union and with NATO, and it was, they were, shall I say, uh, perplexed, if not flabbergasted about it. And uh, it made, uh, it makes enormous sense uh, to Australia. It's something that we encourage and support. Uh, I think Rich is right in the sense that it was, uh, it was perceived, if not portrayed, as a, a security and foreign policy rebalance. Uh, without a sufficient emphasis on the other aspects of uh, US presence within the region. The other thing that um, seemed to get across, seemed to be perceived by those who uh, aren't all that familiar with the US presence in the region, the importance of it, uh, the fact that it, it's, it's been as it is for the, since the end of the Second World War, uh, was that it, um, it, it's just that, it's, it's a rebalance. Uh, it's not suddenly that the US is, is coming to the region and going to increase its presence in the region in all kinds of ways. Uh, so, uh, but I think um, uh, certainly the, the, the right policy, uh, but uh, it could have been designed better and it certainly could have been implemented better. What has been done, by the way, in Australia and how it's being uh, unpacked in Australia, I think is going uh, very well. Um, we're still, we're good. Okay, let's try this again. I, didn't, I was going to go to a show of hands, but it occurred to me there are too many diplomats and business representatives <laughs> for people to actually do this in a non-anonymous way. So now, Will, we can click. So let's see what the audience thought. People are rebalancing as we go. <laughs> so I think the administration, despite the um, occasional uh, criticism in imp about implementation and branding that Rich and I and others have done and some in, in Australia have done, I think the administration should be somewhat encouraged by this response because the number of people who thought it didn't matter or, or didn't know about it uh, is, is very, very low. Um, and it's partly a question of design and implementation. So both of you commented on how it was unveiled. Uh, too much military, uh, perhaps too ad hoc. Um, I got in particular trouble with my wife because... Michael. Yeah. Do you have a different question up, Will? Okay, you may now switch your vote. We're going to do this like a New Jersey election. <laughs> slightly less favorable for the administration. But in, but in terms of the importance of um, focusing on the Asia Pacific, generally, um, I think the consensus in the room is it's, it's important. And by the way, I think although the American public may not know what the phrase rebalance means, uh, polls over the last two or three years have shown that the American public now considers the Asia Pacific region the most important region in the world to US interests. Um, decades and decades of polling 
uh, showed that uh, Americans thought Europe uh, was the most important region. So I don't think this is just a Washington story in a broad sense. It's a story about um, US uh, views of their role in the world. So we've talked a bit about the past. Let me ask you about the present. Um, the uh, Pentagon is um, putting uh, the bulk of new assets in the Pacific, over 60% or up to 60% of Navy surface combatants, um, most of the fifth generation Air Force fighters. The Army is creating a four-star billet and uh, uh, realigning its first corps in the West Coast to the Pacific. Um, and we're negotiating on TPP. So where do you see the pivot right now? Um, not just about the past, but how do you see the prospects for the follow through on what is perhaps now a more balanced and comprehensive view? Well, I, look, we're in a lot different place from uh, two years ago when President Obama, a year and a half ago, announced this and that TPP is well on its way and I think that's terrific. Uh, we're not, we haven't caught up on foreign direct investment, but I think our Secretary of Commerce is going to be doing this soon. We're in a lot better place. And that's what we, the uh, rotation of a Marine Brigade through Darwin, a U.S. Marine Brigade through Darwin, is a good sign. It's a good sign of our cooperation. It's not something that's going to keep PLA military planners up at night. The numbers are not sufficient. But as a sign of our cooperation and our willingness to work together cheek by jowl, uh, it's a very good thing. So I think we're in a much better place uh, now uh, across the board. Yeah, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's going well. And uh, the, it's not just the presence of Marines in Darwin. And uh, Darwin, at the top end of the north of Australia, of course, amongst other things, gives access to the Indian Ocean and uh, through Diego Garcia, leverage into observation and monitoring of maritime routes across the Indian Ocean, which are extremely important. But also the US engagement, uh, US Navy, US Air Force in Indonesia, uh, the combat littoral ships in uh, Singapore, and then in the context of the presence in uh, Korea, uh, Guam, Okinawa, and the increased uh, diplomatic uh, effort that's going on in the region. I, I must say that um, I said to the Europeans uh, who, um, who are understandably focused even more so on themselves these days than they have been in the past that, uh, uh, that uh, diplomacy in Asia is many things, but the first of it is turning up. And uh, it's a bit like marriage, it's bloody hard, but one of the essential prerequisites is to turn up. And the uh, presence of uh, senior US officials uh, constantly from the administration uh, in the region, uh, not just uh, focusing on China and India, but uh, East Asian countries uh, beyond uh, Republic of Korea, Japan into the ASEANs is extraordinarily important. And I think the US has been doing an extremely good job in that regard. So. At the moment, it's going well, and I think uh, the, the other thing that's important is most of the ASEANs uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, understand and appreciate the, uh, the fact that the United States has been following through on the political rhetoric in relation to the region once. Thank you. Um, I earlier started to say I got in trouble with my wife and left that hanging out there, so I suppose I should explain. The um, part of the problem, I think, with the pivot, as Rich mentioned, was the branding. It was uh, first we're back in Asia, then we're pivoting to Asia, then we're rebalancing to Asia. The first one was particularly bad for me because I spent five years on the NSC staff um, uh, disappearing to go off to Asia and explaining to my long-suffering wife that I had an important diplomatic or advanced trip to make. And when the White House announced a few years ago that the US was back in Asia, she turned and looked at me very suspiciously, and said, where have you been going? Um, so they've had some trouble un unveiling it. They've had some trouble branding it. Um, but as I said earlier, I think there's broad uh, understanding in the American public how important Asia Pacific is. The key is to muster the resources and the leadership to follow through. Which leads us to the second question. You can put it up, Will. Um, our alliance uh, in the post-war era, uh, even after Vietnam, uh, operated on the premise that U.S. primacy uh, underlay our cooperation together. And as we think about the shifting power relations, both regionally and internationally, we wanted to ask the audience and our panelists, um, and this is mostly for our Australian friends, uh, how important is continued U.S. primacy to Australia's future security? So please use your clickers.
So either very important, or some say moderately important, and 11% say slightly important. Um, that said, uh, let me turn again to you, Brendan, to start off. Um, how important is it, and uh, how viable is it from an Australian perspective? Well, look, it, it's very important, and uh, I certainly share the view of uh, the majority of the audience, at least, in seeing as being very important or moderately important. Um, it, it's, we're in a world that we uh, have not, we're about to live in a world we've not lived in since the Franco-Prussian War and the Qing Dynasty. The world of 1500 is about to end. And uh, within a decade, we'll live in a world where the United States is uh, perhaps not the largest economy, and on a number of other indicators, we'll have China exceeding uh, the United States. Uh, that, of course, does not mean that uh, the US will no longer have primacy. That primacy is important to us because, uh, as our Prime Minister said in his introductory remarks, uh, we share uh, the view of uh, liberal uh, democracies, of political, economic and religious freedoms, uh, coexistence of faith and reason, free academic inquiry, free press and all of the other things that define our respective societies. But that also is something that is extraordinarily important and increasingly important to the nations and people in the Asia Pacific itself as they emerge uh, from poverty in many cases, their economies are growing and they are increasingly seeing a lot of issues the way we uh, collectively tend to see them. And US primacy in terms of uh, providing uh, continued uh, protection of um, uh, maritime passages in the Western Pacific, uh, providing support for confidence of uh, countries in the region, uh, expressing their point of view and shaping a multilateral, uh, uh, I think, uh, fora for discussion in the region is extremely important to us. Um, I might also add that it's also important to China uh, that, uh, not necessarily US primacy, but it's also important to China that uh, in terms of its significant challenges, uh, most of which are domestic, that uh, the United States keeps the rest of the world in order. And that's in our interest too. Well, of course, it's very important to Australia that the United States maintain primacy, but we don't defi define primacy. If we're talking in the mil military terms, we're going to be. Uh, uh, on top for a long time to come. Our military strength is so enormous. Uh, but primacy, in my view, is defined in a lot of ways, not the least of which is, for instance, education. It's, uh, it's very important, I think, for Australia and all of us that six of the top 10 universities in the world are in the United States, 10 of the top 20 in the world. Uh, our, our economy may be growing at a, a relatively anemic three, three plus percent uh, this year. Uh, but we don't have the same headwinds that China has. If it's true, as I said earlier, that uh, the center of gravity has shifted to the Indo-Pacific, Australia is right in the middle of it. Uh, and in an, another way to look at it, right in the middle of a cockpit of neuralgia, the East China Sea, the South China Sea. The backdrop of this is a rising China. So I think for a whole host of reasons, it's enormously important that we maintain our primacy across the board. Uh, we can use the word primacy, by the way, because we're not the government, um, uh, and we can explore a concept that is pretty es essential to international stability and our alliance. Let me um, flip the coin on you, Rich, and ask how important is Australia to continued American primacy from a U.S. perspective? I've always had a, a view of Australia that's a little different from the view Australians have of themselves, first of all. Uh, I've never been disappointed either. I've always found that Australians punch above their weight. This has been my experience as a young serviceman in Vietnam, in a place called Nui Det, where Australians were, were, were stationed. Uh, it's been my experience working with many governments through the years. So it's very important, I think, that Australia makes us have our best game, it makes sure that we have our game face on in Asia. So I think it's extraordinarily important for us, and I have found it that way historically in my career. So the, the biggest change in international relations within the Asia-Pacific region, and I think many would argue globally, of course, and a topic we'll come back to today, <coughs> is uh, China's growing power influence and the complications, but also the benefits this brings to both of us and to the region and to the international community. 
Um, there's a thesis many of you are familiar with, I suppose I should say a hypothesis, uh, in Australia that Australia has to make a choice uh, between the US and China, or perhaps that um, the US has to make a choice. Um, the question we've put up for you is as follows. Australia has substantial military ties with the United States and also robust economic ties with China. In 10 years, which of these ties will have strengthened? Um, I'll read it in case you can't see it. A, both US security and Chinese economic ties. B, only US security ties. C, only Chinese economic ties. D, neither, and E, don't know. And the question is, which of these ties will have strengthened over the next 10 years? So the uh, majority is uh, well over 80% say both. 1%, um, so only a handful of people think that only US security ties will increase. So it is a, a given. Everyone in the room expects Australia's economic ties with China to increase, I take from that. And, uh, and then 16% uh, say that only Chinese economic ties will increase. So according to international relations theory, you're all wrong, and this is not possible. Um, but according to reality, Brendan Nelson, is, uh, is this possible to walk and chew gum at the same time as we say, to have stronger ties with the U.S. on security and other areas, but also growing economic ties with China? Yes, of course it is, and uh, I obviously agree with most of the audience again on this one. Uh, uh, Australia has uh, managed uh, our alliance with the United States. That alliance has deepened, broadened, it's growing. It's expanded, as I said earlier, into areas well beyond defence and security, as reflected in this today and the, the uh, agenda. But we also have a stable uh, and mature uh, relationship with China. Uh, we have a relationship with China and an alliance with the United States, and there's a difference. Uh, but we also, uh, Chinese uh, people and the leadership are extraordinarily pragmatic. Uh, their key priority uh, amongst them is uh, obviously economic growth. And Australia is extremely important to that. Uh, it's, it's a nonsense. Uh, it, well, it's a personal view, but I think it's a nonsense, this argument you get from sections of the Australian commentariat that Australia is going to have to make a choice between the United States and China. I don't uh, believe that uh, at all. Uh, the Chinese uh, know where we're coming from. Uh, in that regard, uh, again, I, I used to say to the Europeans, uh, exporting your foreign policy into Asia based on uh, Western ideology and a preoccupation with uh, human rights uh, is understandable to a point, um, but it will fail in Asia. But the most important thing is to be very clear about your own values and clear about uh, where you stand and uh, who your key relationships are with. So I would think over the next decade, Australia, China is Australia's uh, major trading partner now. Uh, we don't know entirely what the future will hold, but it's, it's uh, probably the case that that will remain so for, for the foreseeable period. And it's not just in the mining resource sector. I think we often forget about uh, education, uh, for example, which is a major export for Australia to China. Um, but um, I think our, our ties uh, are deepening in the security front with the US and will continue to do so at the same time that our relationship with China uh, strengthens economically. Could I follow up by asking you to shed some light on this for the Americans in the audience, uh, to whom this section of the commentary is a bit baffling? Um, it, it, what, what is it, um, it, it, I suppose putting back on your politicians, that what is it in the Australian political body or media or elite that makes this, not for the government, but makes this a sort of an attractive thesis? Is it, is it just that it's so unusual, or is there something we're missing? Is there something we should worry about? Well, I'm in the situation where the worst thing that can happen to me now is I get sacked, so uh, that doesn't worry me too much, uh, although I do very much enjoy my job as director of the Australian War Memorial. Uh, but um, look, there are some people in Australia, uh, in any country, and I suspect the United States is the same, where it's obvious the world has changed, as Paul Kennedy observed just over two years ago from Yale. That in fact, we may well be moving into, into a new age. Uh, not just uh, a changing world, uh, as reflected by Malcolm Turnbull last night at our, our embassy, but a new age. 
and uh, something that we've, with Asia Pacific coming to the centre and uh, a whole range of changes that are happening uh, in terms of uh, Europe and its preoccupation with itself, uh, the key instruments of the post-World War II world, perhaps not being equipped for the world that is, let alone the one that's coming, uh, the changes that have happened in global reserve currency and a whole range of other things. But there are some people who think, well, OK, China is growing uh, economically and in other ways. It's already surpassed the US in a number of key economic indicators and many more will happen over the next decade. Its military expenditure, to the extent we understand it, will probably equate to that of the US about the end of the next decade. And there are a group of people who say, well, the world has changed. Uh, we now have to change our relationships and the priorities we place upon them. Uh, and uh, th there's a, there seem to be some elements of our commentariat who think in that case, well, if China is going to be more important, uh, perhaps even than the United States, then we, Australia, need to see that our destiny lies there. That uh, increasingly Australians obviously see themselves not only as a part of the Asia Pacific, but uh, perhaps even as a part of Asia itself, even though we have a, a Western political and philosophical uh, heritage. And so there are people uh, perhaps who, who I think, well, they see the, you know, things are moving in that direction, therefore we ought to follow it. Uh, but as I said earlier, but again, it's my own view, I think we have to be very steadfast in understanding who we are, where we come from, our values and our beliefs, the way we see our place in the world, and uh, be uh, strongly committed to our traditional alliances uh, in shaping our place in our own region and the relationship with the uh, largest country in it, which is China. Thank you. Illuminating, but not to the point you'll get fired, so I appreciate that. Um, in this town, uh, those arguments resonate because we have over 1,500 think tanks, so there's a lot of room for it to resonate, but your answer helps really put it in perspective. Rich. I, I would have voted A as well as the majority here did, and I think if I were a citizen of a population-sparse, resource-rich country like Australia, I would only have the confidence to have uh, strong and growing economic ties with China if I had a good security relationship with the United States. Uh, I think that gives you the, the uh, sense of confidence to move forward economically without falling into a, a trap, uh, an economic trap. Uh, perhaps I'm uh, outdated, perhaps I'm an antediluvian in my, my thinking here, but, um, you know, we, we all want the same thing with China, I think. We want a safe, prosperous, stable, rising China. But my view, that is only possible in an area of vibrant economies and democracies. So in a very real way, it, it, it uh, makes our ties across the board with Australia even more important than they would normally be. So we should not, and I would certainly agree with this, anticipate a day when, like Prime Minister Curtin in 1942, an Australian Prime Minister says we turn from Washington to Beijing for our security. Uh, I certainly don't envisage that ever happening. Uh, but uh, certainly, no, I don't envisage that's happening. But, but there is a, there, there a lemming-like effect amongst uh, some people when they see shifts of uh, current, uh, currents of uh, power shifting in different ways. Uh, and I think some of those people need to be reminded that economic strength in itself is not a determinant of, uh, of regional or global influence uh, of itself. And as I said, or, uh, observed earlier too, that. Uh, China is actually, and the, all the countries in our region are relying very heavily on US presence uh, in terms of maritime security to ensure uh, continued economic growth. And uh, uh, apart from anything, I'll also make the observation that Straits of Malacca and uh, Hamutsa uh, uh, rely heavily dependent on uh, US support for uh, continued security. So uh, I think it's a, it, it's a false argument. Um, it's not unhelpful in the sense it teases people to, to think uh, in terms of uh, scenarios, uh, but uh, Australia, look, on both sides of politics in Australia, uh, people know where we're coming from and they, we, we certainly know who our friends are. And uh, I was, when I was at NATO, I'd, I'd often say to 
some of the flaky ones there. Uh, we're Australians, we say what we mean and we mean what we say. We um, uh, conducted a survey here at CSIS of uh, elites, Bates and I actually ran it at the time, um, of elites in 10 Asian countries asking how they saw the future of Asian order unfolding. And uh, the result was quite striking because um, overwhelmingly um, uh, the countries in Asia, not just the US, Australia, Japan, as you'd expect, but Indonesia, India, and so forth, s the response was that the future of Asian order should be built around no conflict and economic cooperation, which you'd expect, but also rule of law, good governance, free and fair elections, and protection of human rights. Um, China was the outlier, um, but even among the Chinese elite, half. I, I, I agreed with that. So uh, economic power is not the only determinant, and Chinese economic power is rising but uncertain, um, but there's a multiplier effect for some of the things that Australia and the U.S. stand for. Let's turn to energy, which will be a topic later today, um, and ask uh, about the impact of energy on U.S.-Australia relations, uh, energy trade central to Australia's economy and foreign policy, and increasingly this will be the case for the U.S. with a shale gas resolution. So we wanted to ask the following. Given Australia's important role as a provider of energy resources to Asian markets and the integral U.S. investment in Australian energy extraction, uh, what is the future for U.S.-Australian energy dynamics? A, the U.S. becomes an export competitor with Australia in Asia. B, uh, there will be diminished U.S. investment, US investment in Australia's energy sector. C, uh, there will be deepening U.S.-Australia joint energy investment to meet growing Asian demand. Or D, don't know. So yeah, A is not surprising, 22%. Uh, um, there are going to be markets, um, natural gas to Japan and Korea, for example, where we'll compete to some extent. Um, but the uh, overwhelming answer is uh, we're going to work together in joint energy investment to meet growing demands in Asia. Rich, what do you think? I'm on the board of ConocoPhillips. We have a major investment in, in Queensland, so I would vote at C as well. If I didn't, I'd be off the board. Uh, but it, is, it reflects, uh, I think, the direction that U.S. industry is going more investment uh, with Australia. And it's a fact that the energy, and as, I, as I understand it, uh, that the energy needs of uh, China, India, and others are going to continue to rise uh, in the out years. So there's going to be, uh, although there's our shale gas revolution in the United States is going to open up, I hope, more export markets for us. Uh, it's quite clear to me that there's going to be enough market out there for everybody. Uh, yeah, the, the audience, I think, is reflecting uh, the reality and the way it's going to go, and uh, that Australia, in part, will be a competitor of the United States uh, on a friendly basis, of course. Uh, the joint investment is probably the more significant way that it's going to go, and, and it reflects, uh, again, the importance in this, in this context, uh, amongst others, of Australia to the Alliance, and also Australia as being a credible and respected uh, player in the Asia-Pacific uh, and a very reliable supplier of energy uh, to nations in our region, of being a, a, a joint partner with the United States makes imminent good sense. It points to one more area where not only the U.S. and Australia are going to be more closely knit together, in spite of the power shifts and economic shifts we've talked about, but also, logically, the whole region should be knit together. Um, this is not 1940-41, where a country can grab energy resources through military force. It's a global market requiring global investment and so forth. Um, let's end uh, the questions with a question about trade. We talked at the beginning in the rebalance about the need to move towards a more comprehensive U.S. Uh, strategy in Asia, including not only the military dimensions that featured so prominently a few years ago, but also trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, is um, certainly from U.S. perspective uh, and from the perspective of those of us who follow this closely at CSIS, uh, really one of the key uh, questions or variables in how successful the, the rebalance and uh, the future of Asia uh, Asian security and stability uh, are going to be in the years ahead. The question we want to ask is uh, as follows. American and Australian leaders have made the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, a central element of both nations' regional strategies. When do you think TPP negotiations will be completed, and when will the TPP be ratified, if at all? <clears throat> um, 
It's a little complicated because we've got two different things, but let's, uh, let's go with, um, oh, here we have uh, uh, both options in the, in the multiple choice. So A, uh, TPP will com be completed and ratified, We're talking about the US Congress here, uh, completed and ratified in 2014, uh, B, completed and ratified in uh, 2015, C, 2016 or later, D, it won't happen, parties will not reach an agreement, or, or E, parties will reach but not ratify an agreement. I'm impressed with the 5% who think the US Congress can ratify this in 2014. <laughs> um, and welcome to Washington. Um, uh, but, uh, but the sweet spot is uh, uh, ratified in 2015 um, or in 2016 or later. Um, of course, 2016 is an election year. Um, so that uh, later may, may be more likely for number C. But the audience uh, uh, is generally optimistic, although it's noteworthy that 24%, um, uh, and if you include the 5% um, next to it, that you know, a substantial minority think this, this might not happen at all. Um, let me turn first to Rich and get your thoughts on the politics, but also the implications and the prospects. You know, I want to start off by protesting. We have a former U.S. trade rep sitting right there, uh, one who can answer this question in his sleep but much more astutely, I think, than I can, and perhaps even Dr. Nelson can. Uh, look, there was an article in the paper today that said something like, uh, the U.S. Congress can't even play small ball. Uh, and that's a reference to Japanese-style baseball. Uh, I happen to agree. Uh, the criticism of Bob Gates about the present U.S. Congress is is uh, certainly uh, uh, validated. Uh, and it leads me to say that uh, 2015 or later, I don't see them moving rapidly on trade promotion authority. Uh, I think they're more intent on tying President Obama's hands than anything else. Uh, and uh, so I think it'll be 2015. 2016, Mike, you have pointed out an election year. It might be too much of a hot, a hot issue at that time. So uh, I'll go with 2015. Um, I'm, I'm not a trade expert, uh, but I know enough about it that, to know that it's pretty difficult to predict with any confidence what's going to happen. Uh, I think it's likely to be concluded, I think that's pretty certain, and will probably be ratified. Uh, but I think it would be particularly ambitious to think that's going to happen this year or, or next year. Uh, from our perspective, we certainly hope that it would. But certainly the credibility of a number of the countries who are key participants, including the Austra Australian and the United States, will be seriously questioned if it's not ratified. Uh, that's for sure. Um, thank you. We have a panel at 1.30 uh, on trade. Um, Wendy Cutler, the, one of the people in the hot seat for TPP, will be here. So uh, the moderator might want to ask her how she'd vote. Um, then being a good USTR official, she'll find a way to evade that. Um, let me ask each for a one or two minute summation of how you think about the answers and the, and the comments uh, we see reflected in these polls and, and the way forward. Can I begin with you, Rich, and we'll end with Dr. Nelson? Yeah, I think I've, I just saw Kim Beasley stick his head in and then out again, and I'm going to tell a, a Kim Beasley story. I was an assistant secretary sitting in my office in the Pentagon, and Kim was the Minister of Defense for the Hawk government. And he called me up and he said, mate, we've got a problem. I said, what's that? And he said, look here, you've got uh, a $10,000 uh, item listed in your military construction for Pine Gap or one of the joint facilities. And a fellow named Des Ball at ANU is all over it. And uh, he's demanding answers from the government and is just dragging us into conflict with the Soviet Union, et cetera. And I had no idea what Ambassador Beasley was talking about because our military construction bill is about that thick, literally thousands of pages. And a $10,000 item doesn't rise to the level of any air breather in the United States <laughs> knowing it's there. So I, uh, I researched it and uh, researched it and researched it and finally found what it was. And it was something like a kitchen renovation uh, or something that was very non-controversial. And I informed Ambassador Beasley or then Defense Minister Beasley, and he was able to answer the questions and this problem went away. But I later said to Secretary Weinberg, this is very unusual. There's no issue that is too small to rise to the highest level of the Australian government. And I thought that was a pretty good laugh line, and I've since become ashamed of it. 
because I've come to realize that it was be just because Ambassador Beasley and his colleagues cared so much about this relationship and cared so much about keeping it on the right track that even small issues will come to the highest level and they'll resolve it. And I wanted to say that in front of Ambassador Beasley. There's a way of apology uh, for making a joke at his expense. Uh, but it's because we've had folks that are willing to work that hard and that assiduously to protect this relationship and to grow it uh, that we've gotten to this point. And I can only trust that we move forward. Those who come in after us, Mike, uh, on the U.S. side and after Dr. Nelson on the Australian side will have the same dedication uh, to this relationship. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, when I fronted the cust U.S. Customs Officer at Fort Worth, he, uh, you know what they're like, they're very friendly people. And uh, he looked at my passport, he looked at me, he looked at my passport. He said, we should have an Australian war memorial in America. And uh, by way of uh, clarifying this, he said, uh, my son came back from Afghanistan last year. And I said to, he said to me, those Aussies, they're amazing people. And I said to my son, he says to me, he said, uh, those Australians, whenever America picks a fight, they're there. They're the first in and the last out. He said, don't you ever forget it. And I thought, it's interesting that there's an American customs officer who at least sees Australia and its role in the alliance traditionally, as I said, in its origins in a, in a strategic uh, defence and security context, now expanded to something more broadly. But in terms of the, the answers and the future of the Alliance, um, when I took the job at the War Memorial, some of my friends were a bit surprised. In fact, one of them said to me, you're wasting your life. You've got far more important things to do for Australia than rearrange its history. And I said to him, actually, it's got a lot more to do with our future because this is who we are. This shapes our values and our beliefs, the way we relate to one another and see our place in the world. And one of the things that I, I think that we can both do, which is about our history but also about our future, is to see that we present perhaps a little bit more of the American story in our key institution, which I'm intending to do with the Australian War Memorial, and you should present more of ours in yours. The First World War Museum in Kansas does it extremely well. I'm going onto the Board of Presidents from the World War, for the World War II Museum in uh, New Orleans, but I think there is a very strong argument for presenting the Australian role in the American story through the 20th century and now this in your museums as much as there is in ours. And I can tell you in concluding that every one of those VIPs, some of whom I know from a previous life, who come for, through our War Memorial, when I take them into the Pacific, and I present to them Coral Sea and Midway and Kokoda and the Philippines and those various uh, the Guadalcanal and all of those places. It's when they walk out of that memorial, they know who we are, what makes us tick, and they understand why we have an alliance with the United States. So. Very well done, both of you. We're going to rearrange slightly the panel to move to the next section. We don't have a coffee break yet. Um, uh, so please bear with us, but first, please join me in thanking uh, our two panelists. <laughs>